So if you're a guest here, if you're finding us by the internet, we're, we're believing this is the season of miracles. We're looking at the seven, mir- seven first miracles of John leading right up to the seventh miracle on Resurrection Sunday. And today, the fourth miracle is one of my favorites. And I wonder if it's one of the Bible's favorite. So, you know, some miracles are shared when you talk about the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some miracles are only mentioned maybe in one of the Gospels or two of the Gospels. Some are lucky enough to be mentioned in three of the Gospels. The miracle we're looking at today is mentioned in all four Gospels. It's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I wonder if this is one of the favorite miracles that God liked that he said, I'm going to let all the Gospels record this miracle that we're going to look at. But to understand this miracle, you've got to understand some of the things God has been doing for centuries. It doesn't really have the power or the impact if you just look at the miracle by itself. You have to know what God was doing through all the centuries in this one area, how he provides. This is a different miracle than all the other miracles. This is the miracle of provision. And to know how he works in this way, you gotta go all the way back to Exodus. Exodus chapter 16, Before we get to the fourth miracle, we gotta look at the foundation of that miracle. And in Exodus chapter 16, there's two million plus people in a wilderness with no food, in a desert with no water, and God provides for them. In verse 31 of Exodus, listen to what it says. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like a quarry, quarry, yeah, Coriander, thank you. You want to help me with that coriander? Thank you. Anybody else want to help? All right. Like a coriander seed and taste it like wafers made with honey. Wow, that sounds like some really good bread there, doesn't it? Now, look at verse 35. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came into the land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. Now, when you see something like that, you always want to see where it's confirmed. When did this manna stop? When did God quit providing? This is God providing. They didn't go to the store to buy bread each day. There was no stores there in the wilderness, in the desert. God each day sent manna from heaven, this wonderful bread that tastes like a wafer and a little bit of honey in it. He sent this every day for him. When did it stop? You got to go to Joshua chapter 5. Now remember Joshua chapter 1 is about them going to cross the Jordan at a flood season and they're going to go over into the promised land. And it's not until Joshua chapter 5 that we get the answer. So when was the very, isn't it amazing, there had to be a last day that the manna fell from heaven. Did you know when that last day was? You probably didn't even think about it. Why? Because you weren't looking to eat from it. This wasn't your, this wasn't your time, but can you imagine for the millions of people, when would be the last day that God would send bread from heaven? We find that answer in Joshua chapter five, verses 11 and 12. The day after the Passover. Ooh, that's important. Circle that. That very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Cana, the promised land is really what it's talking about. So when did the manna stop? You have to get to Joshua chapter 5, and it was the day after the Passover. Now, this shows me, again, I'm going to share you some things before we get into this fourth miracle. This is God's provision, the God of provision. The fourth miracle is about God providing. And as you can see, God has always been a God that knows how to provide. Here we see bread from heaven. Fresh bread. Not stale bread. 
we're going to have sandwiches for lunch today. And, and Mindy said, we don't have any fresh bread. You got to stop at the store on the way home today. We're going to make deli sandwiches. And she goes, I know you like certain types of bread. And I am. I'm, I'm a sticker. I grew up in a, in a little deli in Philadelphia that, that certain, bre- if you're going to have a deli sandwich, you got to have deli bread. You got to have the right stuff. And so Mindy's like, you just pick it up as you come home from church today. I said, I'd, that's, that's my assignment. I'm going to pick up the bread. It, each day they had to pick up the bread from the ground, but it was fresh bread delivered for 14,400 days. That's 40 Hebrew years. A Hebrew year was less than what our year is. It was a 360-day year. So I wanted to give you what that was. That So for 14,440 days, fresh bread was delivered from heaven. The God of provision, isn't he? Now, the day after they celebrate their deliverance, that's what Passover is, their deliverance from Egypt. They were in captivity for 400 years. God gives them this celebration. It's called the Passover celebration. It's the night that the death angel passed over and they ate a meal. And that meal had certain bread in it. When they're in the promised land, after their first Passover meal, That's the day. Forty years earlier, that bread stopped being delivered. After 40 years, I'm sorry, the word after should be in there. After 40 years that started earlier, that bread stopped being delivered. Amazing. God could provide for 40 years I'm so reminded of so many stories that my mom would tell us growing up of of how God provided. And when the last child, we had eight children living in in a three-bedroom house with one bathroom. Tells you you need therapy when you have five sisters and you got to share one bathroom and all that. When the last child, Mary Beth, moved out of the house, my mom had a panic attack. She said, God took care of me because I had those children. What am I going to do now? I said, Mom, do you think God was just taking care of you because of the children? She said, yeah, he he wanted to take care of the kids. I said, he was taking care of you while he was taking care of the children. And he'll take care of you all the days of your life. And I love when my mom was on her deathbed. She said, you know, you remember when I had that panic attack when Mary Beth was moving out the last? And you shared that God took care of me. She said, I asked him that day. God, have you been taking care of me or were you taking care of my kids? And he said, I was taking care of you and I'll always take care of you. Isn't that great? This story of God's provision was so ingrained. These are the stories that they'd sit around at the campfires and tell. Somewhere down there, great, 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 great grandpa ate of that bread of manna from heaven and drank water from a rock that God provided Our God is a God of provision. This became so important to them that it became a part of honoring God. It was a part of their society of honoring God because he was a God of provision. Where do we find that? You've got to go to Hebrews. This is all before we get to the fourth miracle. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. It's a great little passage in here. And it gives us some insight into the Hebrew people. That's who they were. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Say I'm there if you're there, if you found it. Say I'm still looking if you're looking. All right. I'm reading from the New International Version. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place which had the golden altar of incense and the golden covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. I I want you to see, so this miracle that God is a God of provision and he provided for 40 years became such a way of life that they, when they knew about worship in the holy place, the holy of holies, it's only where the high priest could go. But they, 
all the people knew what was in there. It was the Ark of the Covenant. And here's the three things that were a remembrance of the honoring God's miracles. A golden jar of manna. A golden jar of manna. Now, it's very interesting because the, the scriptures tells us that the manna was only good for one day. If you tried to store it, they couldn't store it except for the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day you didn't work and, and God would then allow them to take enough manna that would stay fresh over the Sabbath. So isn't it interesting? God even rested from delivering bread on his Sabbath day. And to remember and honor the, the God of miracles, the God of provision, inside the ark, inside the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was for the, for the Jewish and the Hebrew people, they had this golden jar of remembrance. Some uh, uh, of the historical people and the, and the rabbis all mentioned, because only the high priest knew what was in there, was there really manna in that golden jar? It wouldn't last, according to the scriptures, or was the jar just a remembrance of the miracle God that provided for all those years? In there also was Aaron's staff that had budded. Now, that story is a story that doesn't go with the provision here, but it actually it was a part of what took place there in the desert. Aaron and, and was coming under ridicule. As a matter of fact, both Aaron and Moses were coming under ridicule that who said you guys should be the bosses? That's really what number 17 is all about. Who said you should be the boss? Why can't we be the boss? And they said, let's put our staffs over here in the temple. And let's see whose staff God will bless. The next day, numbers 17, 2 through 5, Aaron's staff not only has things grown out of it, but it budded the flowers a dead piece of wood that God says, this is where the life is. And Aaron was the priesthood, those that would, be, that would be the spiritual leaders over the tribe of Israel. And then the third honoring of, of miracles was the stone tablets of the covenant, where God actually spoke face to face to Moses and gave them, this is how you're supposed to live, and he gave them the Ten Commandments. These were the things that were in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And out of the three major things, a golden jar of manna, a God of provision. You need to know all that background to see that when we come to this miracle, this is a people that have heard about this God, that they have worshiped this God, and that they know the high priest went in and knew of these holy things protected in their temple. Now you can go to the fourth miracle in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verses 1 through 6 is what, where we start out with this fourth miracle. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs what they see? They saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. Watch, what's, watch this phrase right here. The Jewish Passover feast was near. <gasps> the God of provision, when did the manna quit? The day after the Passover feast. A connector. A Hebrew pattern that says, when this happened back here, the bread stopped. Now the Passover feast is near again. This is 1,500 years or so later, the Passover feast that they still celebrate that God set them free from Egypt was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now notice... In my Bible, those words are in red. It's Jesus saying, where do we buy the bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, 
Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fishes. But how far will they go among so many? Let's just pause right there. This fourth miracle is the miracle, again, each miracle reveals something of God. It reveals something of God. This is the God of the whole world. The fourth miracle reinforced that God is our provider, and he's what? He's over the economy. Whoa. He's the one that used the word, let's go buy. Where can we buy bread for everybody? Philip, are you talking like spend money, God, to pay, to feed 5,000 men plus the women and children? See, God wanted you to know that there would be a day and a time where you'd be worried about the economy. Is another recession going to happen? Is a depression going to happen? And should, should we store? Should we have st- things stored up and all the rest? You can do all that you think you need to do. But if you're leaving God out of the process, you're missing out of a great miracle. This miracle was to reinforce that God is our provider. And he's what? He's over the economy. Now, the th- to to take you back, that he's over the whole world. The third miracle that we looked at last week reinforced uh, time is no obstacle for God. The man that was sick 38 years, it didn't matter. Time was no obstacle for God. The second miracle reinforced God is omnipresent. He's in one part of the country and the person that needs to be healed is in another part. Doesn't matter because God's really everywhere. And he says, go home to the father, your son as well. And when he meets his servants the next day, he said, when did my son get better? At exactly one o'clock. Exactly when Jesus said, in this land, that your son in that land reinforces the God who is everywhere. And the first miracle reinforced, God is the creator. He takes a substance of water and he creates wine. It didn't evolve into wine, it, he created it. So we see the first four miracles are, are unfolding what we know about God. And in this fourth miracle, God's having kind of fun at Philip's expense. Philip, where can we buy? God, do you have money that we don't know about? I know that in our account here, we don't have enough money. As a matter of fact, it would take a year and a half wages to give each person a what? A single bite. A single bite. Let's pick up the story now in verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down and about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Wow, let's just pause right there. So many cool things within this. I've probably preached on this miracle, never in it. This is the first time I've ever preached to a series of miracles. All the different miracles, I probably preached on them at one different time. I've never taken seven weeks to go right through these seven miracles like I'm doing here with us right here. And I've listened to many other people preach on it. I I remember, I have one of those minds that when someone speaks something and it's a new aha moment for me, I remember who, where, and all the rest. It was at district assembly a couple years ago that J.K. Warwick, our general superintendent, spoke on this five loaves and the two fishes. He said something really remarkable. He said, what if the young boy didn't give his whole lunch? Well, he said, hey, wait a minute. I see all these people. This isn't going to hit everybody. I want to save one fish for me and one or two pieces of bread for me. You can have the rest. But the boy gave his whole lunch. I think that's so cool. I, I love that, that God is doing something here, and he's including. Here's the observation. God wanted involvement in this miracle. 
He, was, he didn't want it. All the other miracles, in, in, in the miracle with the, the guy that was sick for 38 years, the guy didn't even know it was Jesus, remember? He gets healed and they said, who told you to pick up your mat and walk? And he goes, I don't know. And then he comes across Jesus later and he goes, oh, who are you? Jesus. So he's able to tell the Pharisees, it was Jesus. But he got healed not even knowing who healed him. All he had to do was answer the question, do you want to be well? And he said, yeah, that would be a great thing to happen. But in this miracle, God wants involvement. The first, he wanted the disciples' involvement. Philip, where can we go to buy the bread? Then he sends them out to see what hap- what's out there, what resources are available. And he allows a little boy to be involved. Can you imagine that kid growing up? Can you imagine the stories he was able to tell his children and his children's children? When I was a little boy, there was this teacher. He healed people. He did miracles. People would follow him around the countryside. And I was following him this one day. And I had my lunch that my mama fixed for me. And his disciples came to me and said, would you give your lunch? And we fed everybody from my lunch. We fed everybody from my lunch. And at the end, he gave a basket of bread as a symbol of their involvement to each apostle. Did you catch that in verse 13? How many baskets were left? Twelve. How many apostles are there? Twelve. Verse 13, and they filled twelve baskets. Each disciple gets a remembrance of this miracle that what? God provides. God provides. Now, the story didn't end there. There's two more verses, verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. What an interesting couple verses here. Make him king by force. Well, of course, you're ready to elect this man king when you vote on somebody that he's really over the economy. We're in a presidential election time period where people are going to the polls and they're voting on who they think could be a nominee for one of the parties for us to vote for because we want someone over our economy that will help us. You can imagine if one of them said, okay, everybody, today you get a free meal. It's not going to cost you anything and I can just perform a miracle and everybody eats. You go, I know who I'm voting for. I'm voting for the one that can do the miracle, right? So that's where the people's hearts were. And Jesus knew they were going to try to force him to be king. Here's three things that God spoke to my heart. You cannot force God. You cannot force God to act when you want him to act. That's very important. You cannot force God to act when you want him to act. Two, you cannot force God to be something he is already. They were going to force him to be king. He was king already. They just didn't know it, did they? And the third thing is you cannot force God. God doesn't perform miracles. His presence is miraculous in itself. His presence is miraculous in itself. When God's there, you have the miracles there. If you're with God, you're with the one that can take care of all your needs. You would think this would be the end of this miracle and all the rest, but if you remember, what was the timetable? It was the Passover. When did the manna, the bread from heaven, quit coming? It was right after they celebrated their first Passover in the promised land. And for some reason, if you jump ahead in chapter 6 to verse 58, Jesus is speaking again. This is well after the the miracle it's a few days easily because he's going to do the next miracle next week he's going to walk on water 
And, and we get to verse 58, and he says this. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, he wasn't talking about the bread that he created a few days ago. They probably still had leftovers in their baskets. He wasn't talking about if you eat of that bread, you're going to live forever. He was talking about himself. That he is what? The bread of life. So how do we eat from Jesus? How do you, he, he just gave us a, a secret here that, yes, he's the God over the economy, but he wants to be God over our lives, and he wants you to learn to be sustained. Not through the worldly things, but to be able to be sustained in life through Jesus, and that you could live forever. He was talking about salvation. There's no surprise that if we jump forward for a couple of years here that Jesus then takes the bread and breaks it and says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. So you can see what he's saying right here is he's saying to them, you guys, you've been looking for God and you've been looking for him in the signs and the miracles. And, and yes, God is miraculous. He's over the economy. There's nothing that he can't do. I'll give you a little secret. He didn't even need the kids' lunch. He just wanted people to be involved. If he could make bread come from heaven for 40 years, don't you think he could have fed them without anybody's involvement? But he wants you and I in a relationship with him. And he's saying that this relationship is where you look to come to him and he helps you every day in your life. And when you receive him in that way, he will help you for all eternity. The manna that was in the Holy of Holies is really a symbol that God kept people alive for 40 years. And Jesus is saying, and I can keep you alive forever. In closing, we're going to share in the sacrament that he gave us as a remembrance of this miracle. The God who is over all our provision, the God who is over the economy, and the God that can keep you alive forever. If you'd close your eyes and bow your heads, I want to talk to especially some of you that you may not know Jesus in this way. You may only have known him as a teacher. You may only know him as this person in the Bible. He is the God that is here today. That's why we're in church. We've come to worship him. And in just a few moments, the ushers are going to pass out the communion elements and, and we're going to share in them together a remembrance that what he did will keep us alive forever. It doesn't mean this body won't die. It means that which makes you, you, lives forever. And so if you haven't understood that truth, if, if that, maybe today for the first time you're going, this Jesus can give me a life that I'll live forever, the answer is yes. And in a few moments you're going to take symbols that says he paid a price so that you don't have to die for eternity. You can live. He gave his body and his blood to pay the price for your sins and mine. So with your eyes closed, would you slip your hand over your heart right now? This is really your knowing center right here. He said he wants to come and live inside your heart. And if you allow him in, he becomes your provider. He becomes your Lord. He becomes your God. He becomes your way to live for eternity. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you're God. I believe you did all those miracles. I believe you died on the cross and you rose three days later. I believe you can come and live inside my heart. So forgive me of my sins. 
and come live inside my heart. I receive you. You are the Christ, my Savior, my Lord. I receive your gift, eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our praise team is going to come back up, and we're going to, we're going to uh, pass out the communion elements here, and we want you to hold on to them because we're going to take, it's the family table. It's the family table. If you just prayed that prayer with me, guess what that means? You are a follower now of Jesus Christ. He is actually living inside, and he will start speaking to your heart about how to live. Hold on to these elements and we'll partake as a family. Enjoy what they represent. That wafer represents the manna that God delivered from heaven. And then that manna took on the flesh of Jesus Christ and took on the penalty of my sins and yours. That's why I don't use the cracker that many churches use. That's why I use the wafer. It is part of the symbol. I wish they would dip it in honey like it says in the Bible. It is a wafer. But I wish it had the honey flavor that the manna from heaven had. But it's as close as I can find here on earth that symbolizes the God that knows how to be the God of provision. And this is the symbol. It's your life provision. It's your eternal life provision. Hold on these. Let's worship them together as there's...
miracles reveal who God is. The God of the universe. He created it all. The God who's omnipresent. He's everywhere. The God that's over time and space. The God who's over the economy and our provision. We live in such special days. Only when we get to eternity will we be able to look back and see how special these days really are. Daniel records that God gave him these visions about the end times and he was to seal them until the last days and that they would then be unsealed and revelation knowledge would explode. This June will be 31 years that I've been preaching as a pastor. And I have to admit to you, the knowledge of the Word of God is exploding today like I've never seen it before. In my own mind, in my own spirit, and in the men and the women that I listen to, kind of maybe as a little cherry for some of you is that like to know does this really tie into our future the God who said he's the manna that if you eat of him you'll live forever it's not going to be on the screen but in Revelation chapter 2 listen what he says to the church in Revelation whoever has ears let them hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. To the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Known only to the one who receives it. You that prayed that prayer for the first time and you asked Jesus you acknowledge that he is the God that died for you and rose for you and you invited him inside your heart he's going to start giving you things that you're going I didn't understand this before I couldn't comprehend that and now I see so clearly God's direction as a matter of fact I've shared this with some people that they didn't even know they were saved. They said, God's been showing me some things. I said, do you know what that's a sign of? No, it's a sign of salvation, hidden manna, hidden provision. He's showing you things that he wanted you to know. You put salvation in a box. You thought salvation was all these other things. And it's a relationship with Jesus where he can speak to you and you allow him to be Lord. The fact that he's speaking to you shows that he is becoming Lord in your life. Hidden manna, hidden provision, hidden insight. He who knew no sin, that's why this wafer is white. Yeast, regular bread that has yeast in it was a symbol of the Old Testament of sin. But he who knew no sin came to the earth and died for you and I. So that what? This gift that we could live forever would be ours. Take of the communion host in remembrance of all that Christ has done for you. The cup, the fruit of the cup. On the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed, he took it and he said, this is my blood. It wasn't his blood. It was a symbol of his blood. And that it would be poured out for all mankind. The blood is your life flow. Jesus gave his life flow so that all mankind 
could live forever. No matter what part of the world you came from, no matter what culture, no matter what religious background, Jesus gave his blood so that you could have eternal life. Drink of the cup in remembrance of what Christ has done for you. Would you bow your heads and just thank him? Privately just thank him? You may recall how he's provided for you. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You may recall the first time you were saved and how exciting it was to know the truth that many are discovering. They'll discover it here online. Some have discovered it here in the service today. Just thank him. You just shared in manna from heaven the symbol of the God that came from heaven so that you could live forever. We thank you, Jesus. Sometimes words can't even express how grateful we are. You've given us everything we need. You have provided. These miracles cause us to fall in love with you in a greater way. And I pray for those that need provision. In this miracle, you asked for involvement. I pray that our involvement in the miracle of provision would be that we trust you. We will trust you. We will trust you with our finances. We will trust you with what we own. We will trust you with our very life. For you have provided for us. We love you today. We acknowledge you today. You are our God, and there's none besides you. We praise you, and we give you the glory. We look forward to spending all eternity with our God. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, I know that uh, we're enjoying some wonderful weather outside there. That's part of God's provision for Southern California. Amen. And uh, it's going to be raining tomorrow. If you would think about tomorrow in, in your mid-morning, uh, we have several of our students from from Arrowhead Christian School here that, that help us with our video. Two new ones today for their first time. Mike and Wallace are here today. And their host mom is here, Becky, back there today. And we thank you for being here and being a part of our, our service. Pray tomorrow morning and all week long this week. Arrowhead Christian School is has a revival this week. They're going to have five chapel services Monday through Friday where they're going to share with the with the students there about the loving God and loving others and pray especially for tomorrow for me because I'm going to be the speaker in their chapel tomorrow and I'm looking forward to being able to share with them and I'm believing that many of those that attend a Christian school if they haven't yet that tomorrow they will accept Jesus Christ as their savior and so keep us in prayer tomorrow morning and all that greet one another take someone out to lunch remember to do acts of random kindness all week long bless your community god bless you and thank you for being in church today